Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. We're back. We're live. The two o'clock block here on Think Tech Community Matters is the show, the series. And we have Peter Carlisle, former mayor, former prosecutor, practicing attorney, done it all. Hi, Peter. Thanks for being yeah, it's here. It's great to be here, as always. You know that. It's a good day. So what provoked this discussion is the death of Ronald Rewald. He was a piece of Hawaiian business history, don't you think? He was a piece of uh, very, very uh, untoward behavior. He was one of the greatest con mans that ever hit uh, Honolulu, Hawaii, and uh, he has now met his uh, reward, and uh, I'll say no more about that, but uh, he was somebody who was absolutely blindingly greedy and spent 10 years of an 80-year term in prison, which wasn't half of what he deserved. Yeah, it's so interesting. Well, let's, uh, let's unpack it a little bit. At the time of all the Rewall thing, you were the prosecuting attorney for the city and county of Honolulu. Uh, can you talk about your career as such? Well, it, I mean, I started off as a line prosecutor. I always knew that I wanted to be a prosecutor, and I, 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 it's always been my opinion uh, that law enforcement are really the guys in the shining armor, uh, and that is not what has happened recently in the corruption problems that we've had in Honolulu. But uh, the truth of the matter is the vast majority of police officers are dedicated to what they do, and they do it very well here. And they actually have very distinct impact on the community. When they start sweeping people who have committed crimes, when they start uh, going after violent people, when they start going after people who use guns uh, irrationally and dangerously, uh, they step in, and because they've stepped in so effectively, crime rates have gone down and stayed down. So how does how the prosecutor interface with the police? I mean, there, there's a role, there's a connection, isn't there? What is it? There is. There's actually, there is a sort of a, a, a person in the middle, which is the screening deputy. And so the police officer does the investigation. Uh, they come in and they speak to the screening division person. And they decide whether there's enough for probable cause. Is it a case that's got some problems with it? Is it something there more activity could be done on the investigative side or the police side that could make it a stronger case? Uh, and then once that's done and they're satisfied that there is a case that has probable cause and there is a reasonable likelihood of conviction, then in you go. So somebody from the office of the prosecutor is the screening person, and it, it sounds just like TV. It does sound just like TV, and you know, because uh, you know, TV every once in a while imitates real life. Not always, not frequently, but uh, there is no doubt about it that there is uh, law and order. Oh, well, funny you should mention that term. <laughs> so, in your time, what was it like? I mean, what was your, you know, your agenda, your model, your way of doing business as a prosecutor in those days? Well, it used to be when I when I first came over here from the mainland, uh, and I knew that that's the job that I wanted, and I worked my way into it. Um, there was this huge problem that it was looked at as just sort of where all the bad attorneys would go to that couldn't get themselves the lucrative jobs in the, uh, in the big law firms, and therefore you were dealing with somebody who, at very best in terms of their attorney skills, was sort of a dull normal. And happily, uh, over a series of years, uh, that whole idea of an absence of a professional law enforcement community uh, evaporated. And that was good for everybody. What do you look for in, a, in an assistant prosecuting attorney, somebody to go out and try the cases and, and you know, handle the day-to-day -day workflow? You know, it's interesting because you have to figure out what is their skill set that they're bringing to the table. If they are an appellate attorney and that's what they do well, then you put them in that particular position. And that doesn't involve going to courtroom and speaking in front of juries. It's going in and doing legal research and doing it effectively and doing it well, which they were no, notorious for being one of the better appellate divisions in the entire state. Mm. So uh, that's step one. Uh, step two is if you've got people who want to stand in front of the juries, who want to do the types of case, perhaps the big complicated cases or the white collar cases, then you give them the opportunity to do what they do, and they'll end up doing it very well if it's what they like to do. Well, sometimes, uh, you know, I'm, I'm only gauging this from what I see on TV. Sometimes there is no case, or there shouldn't be a case, and the prosecutor has to sort of, uh, you know, wean himself away from the notion of I want to win, I want to uh, indict, I want to, uh, I want to convict, uh, I want to send to jail, against the notion of, um, you know, gee, if he's not guilty, I shouldn't be prosecuted. That, that's 100 percent true, and and actually, that's a, a requirement of prosecutors. Our job is not to seek merely convictions, but to see that quote justice is done. 
Now, uh, according to many of the members of the defense bar, the, the, perhaps the more uh, avid of them, the only way that justice is done is, is their client is released. Uh, well, that's not actually true at all. So what we do is we make sure that if we have something that we have a question about, that we have something that we have concern about, and we, it keeps on coming up over and over again, no matter what you ask or try, then you're probably not going to take the case. Ah, so you have that authority, that discretion. This is very powerful stuff. Uh, you do it when you're the head guy. I mean, yeah. you can tell them exactly yeah. these are what the guidelines are, but basically, you're not going to treat people like children who are professionals. And most of the people who gave advice uh, and were acting professionals, and that was the majority of the people in the office, you would get the right result. So turning to the, the 80s, when Rewald was doing his business, quote, um, you know, I was telling you before the show that I recall uh, so many scammers on Bishop Street. It was like replete with scammers of every kind of nature, um, doing these Wild West kind of companies and things and scams. Um, it wasn't violent. It was white collar. But they were, some of them were really good at it. Can you describe, at least from the point of view of the prosecutor, can you describe what that, what that a part of Hawaiian history was like, what that part of business history was like in those days? Well, I, I think calling it the Wild West is probably not an unfair uh, accusation. And the, the, the more important thing with those type of people is, is that if you give them a taste of purgatory, they're going to change their business model. And they may go off and do something now that's actually productive for the community because they don't want to end up sitting there in a very unpleasant prison cell with a roommate who might not be the world's friendliest person. Yeah, and who might be a violent criminal. Could be, and then ultimately that is enough to satisfy some of them that it's time for a career change. But not always. And if they keep on coming around and around again, even if it's, quote, nonviolent, because I think almost anything that has to do with taking people's money uh, and those people reacting violently for what's happened to them, uh, all of those things lead to very, very difficult confrontations mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes very dangerous con confrontations. So you want to be able to convince that person, okay, stop. And if they don't, then uh, they're gonna, they have nobody to blame but themselves. So when a prosecutor, when the prosecutor's office gets involved in a white collar kind of crime, because you can tell pretty early that it's white collar versus another kind, um, as opposed to the other kind, what, what's, the, what's, the diff, what's the fork in the road there? How do you treat it differently? Well, one is, one is a, a blunt trauma situation, yeah. and the other one is a business, although an illegal business situation. Yeah. And so you have to approach that with different types of uh, strategies. And with the violent confrontation where there's death, where there's mutilation, uh, where there's sexual assault, where there's domestic violence, those things you have to step in immediately uh, and to make sure that the behavior stops. And uh, it's not easy to do, particularly at the lower levels, because you know misdemeanors aren't taken very seriously uh, in certain circumstances. Now there's a much more fluid uh, way of approaching uh, domestic violence and realizing that that is sort of the mother of all disasters, because that's what causes crime to grow. Perpetuates and thrive. it yeah, down the yeah, generations. Exactly. That's, that's much better put. Uh, that's exactly what it is. And so that's uh, the thing that you have to be able to do if you're going to be dealing at the root cause of crime. So there's an immediacy in that kind of case. Yes. And in the white collar, you can afford to, to take it with a little uh, less alacrity. Well, I think what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to do a better case in terms of analyzing and gathering evidence, because some of these are very complicated. Uh, they require boxes and boxes of documentation. Uh, you need to be able to check and follow the money, which the, the criminal element is trying not to let you follow it, and you have to try and do their, your best to get over whatever landmines they've uh, uh, basically put in your path. And that becomes very, very significant. Intellectual experience. Yeah. Yeah, well, it, actually it is, uh, you know, which is why I didn't do much of it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, but yeah, you have people who are dedicated to white collar work. Uh, certainly that's true for the U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, that's what they do most of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and it has a very, very distinct impact on the criminals who are doing it. Yeah. Unfortunately, not particularly well done or uh, enacted when you were dealing with Ryan, uh, Rewald. Yeah, let's, 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 let's turn to Rewald for a minute. Uh, he was really a special case. And, you know, I think we all wondered about the name of that firm. Was it... Uh, 
Bishop, Bishop uh, Baldwin, Dillingham, really? Dillingham you know, Rewald, they and had, somebody else. Uh, what was the, this Bishop wonderful Baldwin. thing? They had, they, they had a wonderful name. But, uh, oh, oh, yeah. Ronald Rewald, no, this and, is uh, Peter is reading from the article in the Star Advertiser, which talked about uh, Rewald's death and his life and times last week. And uh, it, was, it was so interesting that you said to yourself, hey, this, this guy is involved with the biggest names in the history of the state. Bishop Baldwin, Rewald, Dillingham, and Wong. <laughs> Wong was a young kid. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, and you know, this guy was so completely shameless. I mean, he was uh, robbing from people. He was stealing money from people who were uh, his friends. He was stealing money from people who lived next door to him. He was stealing money from people who were blind. You name it, he would steal from them. I have a recollection that's coming back to me talking with you about a woman who was fleeced by, by Rewald. And uh, she went into a bank, I think it might have been the Bank of Hawaii, and she said, you know, why can't you give me, you know, 97% interest this year in my money? Uh, Bishop Baldwin is doing that. <laughs> And this was a kind of tip-off. There was something wrong in Mudville. Oops, oops. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it was outlandishly uh, a bunch of bravado and success, and then blaming the CIA for this, and then talking about how uh, he had been absolutely robbed blind, and uh, the, the police are all corrupt, and everybody's corrupt, and uh, uh, he had uh, lots to say about that, none of which was true. All of it was hogwash, and every ounce of it should have kept him in jail way longer longer than 10 puny years. And, and Bishop and Baldwin, they had not, there were no bishops, no Baldwins in the company, it was just him. There, so, was, there, was, no, there was no level of lying that he did not reach and breach. That style. <laughs> they should have made a movie, you know. Oh, they, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, not yeah. too late. <laughs> I'm trying to think who the actor would be. <laughs> so how did this come to your attention? I mean, this this could have gone on for a while. It wasn't really sustainable over time, but yeah. it could have gone on for a while. How did you catch it? Well, it was basically a bail hearing. And, uh, you know, and then I was briefed on what was going on and, uh, you know, all of this CIA nonsense. Uh, uh, we ended up... At that point, I got to stand up in front of uh, the judge and start talking about just exactly what this guy had done and what an absolutely miserable excuse for a human being he was. Uh, and he was sort of like glaring at me, uh, and uh, it was it was fun. I mean, it was really enjoyable because he was so awful and so completely despicable that it was a pleasure to start, you know, spewing misery in his Makes direction. Makes it all worthwhile. Yeah, you know, I mean, it was, it's, it's, I mean it, it, none of it should have happened, but the payback for him, if they had actually been stern with him, uh, was perfectly delightful. Yeah. So you won the bail hearing. In other words, no bail for Ron. I, you know, I'm trying to think back on that. I don't know whether that or whether he had enough money so that he could actually pay, pay, bail. pay the yeah, bail, yeah, yeah. which I'm sure parting with money from him, unless it was going in his direction, was something he was very un, not fond of at all, didn't think was fair. Uh, and uh, so, but I, I seem to recall it kept him in for a while. So then there, be, there the began the, uh, the ex experience of gathering evidence of seeing if, um, you know, you could prove this uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, well, it's a bail hearing, so that's not necessary. But ultimately, so, after ultimately, the bail hearing. Ultimately, it is going to be proof beyond a reasonable yeah, yeah. doubt. And so that's, that's a chore when you have a white-collar situation like this. You have to go through all the records and all the files and see what's there. And you also have to find stuff that uh, is ex called exculpatory evidence, which means that this suggests that he really isn't guilty yeah, of any yeah, crime. Yeah. So. Uh, and that's, in, in his case, it was not difficult to yeah. see that there was nothing that was remotely exculpatory about his conduct. Peter Carlisle, yeah. former mayor, former prosecutor for the city and county of Honolulu, and the guy who handled the Rewald investigation, Ronald Rewald, died last week, and it's really worth uh, looking back on his life and, uh, and uh, his, uh, his trouble with the law. I can't say that I was the person who was in charge of the investigation. I was in charge of the bail hearing and then a few other things I got involved with tangentially. But the, the real people who were going into that were the people who were uh, the federal U.S. attorneys and mm. uh, oh, as well yeah. as... Uh, as well as uh, the people who had done some of the more obvious uh, issues of okay. basically white collar we're, we're still going to take this one minute break. Okay. Well, and go, we're still going to yes. come back and talk to you some more about it. Well, That's Peter Carlisle. I insist on that. <laughs> 
Aloha. I'm Kili'i Akina, and I'm here every other week on Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. In Hawaii Together, we talk with some of the most fascinating people in the islands about working together, working together for a better economy, government, and society. So I invite you into our conversation every other Monday at 2 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Join us for Hawaii Together. I'm Kili'i Akina. Aloha. Welcome to Sister Power. I'm your host, Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, where we motivate, educate, empower, and inspire all women. We are live here every other Thursday at 4 p.m., and we welcome you to join us here at Sister Power. Aloha and thank you. Now, I want to tell you something, and I wasn't kidding. I, I said we'd come back, we came back. I said Peter would still be here when we came back, that's Peter Carlisle, and we'd still talk about Ron Rewald after we came back. It's all true. I was trying to escape, but they wouldn't let me out over here. They've got people with guns, it's frightening. Okay, one has a club, and they're looking at me menacingly. <laughs> okay, Peter, so, you know, so now this is going to reveal itself, uh, the other agencies involved, as you mentioned. Right. Um, you know, what, what was the law enforcement side of this, and who was involved, and what was the mission, and how did they work together? Well, everybody was cooperating to do whatever they could that needed to be done. So I stepped in for this small area that involved uh, trying to keep him uh, on bail, uh, not permitting him to be on bail. But there was interaction between the police department, there was interaction with the federal people. Uh, they ended up having an enormous trial that uh, ended up going on for, I think it was 11 weeks. That's huge. And nearly three months. 140 witnesses. <laughs> That's an enormous, and it's all, a lot of it's paper. So uh, they were, they, I can't imagine how many stacks of, you know, bankers' boxes there were. And how much research to look at all that and figure out what's what. And you have to go through all of it. You know, and you have to go through all of it with a fine tooth comb to see what is there that should be there, what is admissible. So you have to put the, the law into effect as to whether you know you can't be asking this because it's a criminal case. Yeah. Uh, and that makes all the difference in the world because then you have all of the plethora of rights that are given to a criminal defendant. Sure. So there was a jury trial. It was a jury trial. It was a jury trial. Oh, major. Juries, you know, can get so confused. You give them an 11-week trial, that's a long time for a jury. And, and 140 witnesses, you could get confused. Uh, you could, but in this case, I think what you also have is uh, after you hear all of what he has done and the helplessness of the people who he victimized, uh, the jury, I would think, would have been uh, easily impressed with how awful this guy was yeah. and what a horrible thing he'd done to all of these innocent people. And I mean, he would, I mean, he's literally the kind of person who would, you know, throw his blood relatives underneath the, uh, underneath the train. This is like that case in New York with the Ponzi. It was a Ponzi, right? The fellow uh, who, you know, took people's investments uh, and then took other investments to pay the interest on the first investments and on and on. That's, there's, uh, there, there's been so many of these Ponzi schemes that I don't yeah. know, I don't remember that specific one. A couple, one, three years ago, but, I, I can't remember his name right now, but it was huge. And the amount of money was in the hundreds of millions. It, and it's staggering. Staggering. I mean, it is staggering. And, and you know, and, and it's in the halls of the most venerable uh, financial institutions that we have in the country. And yet we find out that they're being run by people who are uh, don't understand the basic meaning of integrity or truth. So what what what, what did Rewall do? What was his mo? He would he would take he would solicit your investment. He would take your money. He would presumably invest it, but maybe not. And then he would take somebody else's investment and cover interest on it. The starting point was he would promise you a return of twenty percent or more. So now nobody is going to believe that uh, if they're somebody who's financially sophisticated. So he would go to friends, relatives, people who trusted him, people who thought that he was, you know, the next best thing to, to uh, canned beer. I mean, he was just absolutely... He must have been very charming. Uh, he was, in many ways, a real good, slick salesman. And uh, sales is a part of almost all of our professions. Uh, and this guy was a very good one with uh, almost uh, no ability to separate what's right from what's wrong. So the elements of that offense would be he had, to, he had to know he was lying when he told him he was going to give a big return. Um, he, had to, he had to know that he was not going to pay it back to them when he took their money. And in fact, he didn't pay it back and essentially stole it 
and applied it to his own expenses or maybe to paying interest uh, other people he was scamming. Uh, well, and it's also, you know, all of those things that are the entourage, there's the, the boats, uh, there's the cars, well. the, the limousines, there's uh, he, the, the, the building that I live in now, the Pacific right? Guardian, he had one in there that was on a floor that was I above remember, ours, yeah. and it had a flowing waterfall coming down oh, inside the building, uh, and, you know, I, I mean, and all of it was done in solid gold. Yeah, so that people thought, this guy must be so incredibly successful, you know, he's got to be good. He knows how to invest. Well, of course, you know, and then uh, you had the credentials. I mean, he went to, uh, he did go to MIT, and he was a member of the, the CIA and all the rest of that stuff, none of which had anything to do with the reality of the planet did, did Earth. Did he, in fact, go but, to MIT? <laughs> I think he didn't quite get out of high school. <laughs> okay. So he was well known for that, and had actually gotten convicted of theft when he was a student. Really? Mm -hmm. now, the, now the CIA, there was something in the article, and I wonder if you remember, there was something in the article about how he actually was a front for the CIA. He, he rented space to them. That was it. He rented space for their office or something in uh, downtown, um, probably out of that office with the waterfall. Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> and, and he told everybody that he was working with the CIA. And there was definitely contact between him and the CIA. So, it, it, and he took that kernel of uh, knowledge and fact and turned it into an entire field of corn. So was this case uh, heavily resisted in that 11 weeks of trial? Oh, it was, yeah, it was definitely a big a, fight. Yeah, it was a big fight. And although he did not take, he did not take the he stand. He never took the stand. Yeah, so, uh, but yeah, he, it was definitely a, a battle between the uh, federal public defender and uh, the forces of good as opposed to evil. You were, you were counsel in that, in that no. trial? No, nope. Did you observe it? I did not go and observe it. I was uh, too busy doing sort of like my usual blunt usual trauma thing. cases. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what year was it, do you recall? Probably in the article it somewhere. Should be somewhere in the it's article. It's got to be in the 80s, I think. You know, we were all I think you're right on that. I think it was... Maybe 80s, early 90s. So. I think you're right. I think it was the 80s and 80s, maybe even the 70s Piece and 80s. Uh, here we go, in the 70s and 80s. 70s. Nine years Rewald lived in Hawaii. Only nine, nine years. So he could achieve this huge um, structure, you know, the Ponzi structure, and come down <laughs> all in seven or eight years. And, and in the process, uh, enrich himself with millions and millions of dollars. So was the money recovered, do you, you know? Uh, most, much of it was not. Not? Not. He'd spent it or he'd spent it. hidden it somewhere. Yeah, he'd spent it. So he had, he had done exactly what he planned to do, which was to use it to his advantage. And at the end, he was convicted, what, on all counts, some counts? I think counts? something like 92 counts or something like fraud. that. So it was, yeah, it was fraud, and it was theft, and it had other things that they threw in, which I can't remember all of them, because uh, for one thing, I think it was all on the federal side, so I, and I don't practice that type of law, but it's was, basically stealing. Was this a federal trial or a state trial? I thought that it ended up being a, a federal trial. Mm, possibly, yeah. And at, no, but I can't say that absolutely unequivocally. Can, can you say whether he was alone or whether there were other defendants with him? He was the key defendant, and I don't recall whether they had anybody else on top of it. So, maybe, maybe. And then the really nice thing about it is after he uh, failed in that regard, he still ended up in 2010 as working as the director of operations for Beverly Hills-based talent and literary agency, I saw APA. that in the article. That's extraordinary. Yep. I mean, I mean he, he, he was up to it right until the very end. So he gets convicted. He goes to jail for how his sentence was His sen sentence was 80 years. 80 years. And the amount of time that he spent in jail was less than 10. Wow. What, what, uh, he was, I guess it was good behavior or something along those lines? Yeah, whatever it did, it was a system that wasn't working correctly. If it had been working correctly, he would never gotten out at anything less than 20 to 30 years. Why is that? I mean, is it that he was, um, he was in, incorrigible or there are so many people, I, oh, you're saying it again, so many people were, were affected and, and, uh, and, and, and damaged in the process. That for one, but yeah. there's also the, the, the love of deterrence. Okay, I mean, it's if somebody is living like that, and so that then that life is cut out from underneath them, and they're living in a small cramped cell, uh, that is supposed to give everybody the absolute certain knowledge that if they do this type of behavior, they're going to go and spend and lose decades out of their lives. 
Th does that work? I mean, I, we're talking about Rud Rudolph Giuliani in New York. He he went after every crime, no matter how big or small, and he had a very positive effect when he did that. So it's, 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 it's long been true that this is a, a, an effective way of stopping people from doing something. I used an example, I believe it was in 1600 in China, there was this enormous problem with one of the sort of the the rogue areas in China, and these people were going off and killing people and stealing their money, so they were basically cutthroats. And uh, the central government, whatever it was at the time, went charging down there uh, with a, a display of force, gathered every one of them up, uh, lined them up in a, in, a, uh, uh, in a row, and started cutting off heads. And then they put the heads on a spike, and they pointed it in the direction of uh, Beijing. And the reason that they did all that was to let everybody know that this was not going to be tolerated. And the next 10 years, crime rates had been cut in half. Mm. So well, does that kind of violent, barbaric behavior that we would never consider doing today. Yeah, we couldn't do that today, yeah, for sure. It, is it effective? Yes, it's effective. Well, within the context of today, we have white collar crimes that are really serious. And I, I speak of hacking, for example. Sure. I don't think the community fully understands the damage that a hacker can do um, to anonymous you know, groups of people, large groups of people. Uh, and it can really hurt society in general. But they treat it as, um, you know, as, as a joke, maybe. Uh, I don't think. A I don't prank. think. I, I think. Well, that's what. The, the, yeah, the person who's doing it thinks yeah. it's funny. Yeah. But you can quickly stop that with a couple of very significant jail terms. Yeah. And sit there and say, okay, you want to play games? We'll play games with you, but you'll be playing them in prison. You know, it's very interesting, Peter. On this very note, uh, I went to the Pacific Telecommunications Conference uh, a few weeks ago, um, and there were lots of technology guys there. And I said, you guys are able to, uh, you know understand and intercept uh, hacking, you know? And uh, can you tell who's hacking? Can you track it back and find out who the culprit is with any degree of certainty or specificity? And he said, and a number of them said, yes, we can. The level of the technology now permits us to do that. So I suggest to you that, you know, we won't come current. And uh, uh, the notion of prosecuting for the sake of deterrence it's all the more important now in the, in the, in the time of hacking as a white collar crime. Well, you can see the impact of it already. I mean, we're, we're watching TV on a daily basis. Some new person is being accused of doing something nefarious and proves out that they can actually prove that they're doing it in a nefarious fashion, and uh, then they should be punished, and significantly so. And, I, yeah. you know, if you're talking about people's livelihoods being taken away from them. Uh, you know, this is the kind of stuff that leads to suicides, it leads to, yeah. uh, you know, it, it leads to all sorts of, or a complete uh, lack of faith in their own judgment, you know, and so then for years they, they live with the thought that, you know, I'm so stupid, why did I allow this to happen? Yeah. And it was not their stupidity that was occurring, it was somebody else's uh, aggressive criminality. Yeah, and a lack of confidence in the system around them, in the world around them, that could, that could ruin your whole day, not to believe in, in the system and the government around you. Yeah, I mean, and, I, and right now I think we've, we've got a good case of where I don't think people do trust their government. And uh, I think that that's a, a complete uh, flaw in a system that requires trust in government. And you take a look at some of the people in government now and some of the stuff that they're doing and serial liars and the rest of those kind of things coming to the forefront. Uh, that's not the way the United States is supposed no, to operate. No. We have to protect our people, care for each other, and we have to prosecute crimes, and we can't let this happen with, with impunity the way it has. Well put. Yeah. So um, do you miss those days, Peter? I, you know, I enjoyed the trial, the trial, uh, trial work, but when I walked out of the prosecutor's office, I'd done pretty much everything that I could do uh, in terms of trial work, and uh, I was real pleased with it. So uh, there's a part of me that misses it, but uh, there's a part of me that absolutely and unequivocally kneels and bows in a uh, humble fashion before my wife, who, <laughs> if, if she suggests that I'm not going to be doing this, I would be willing to bet you I'm not going to be doing it. <laughs> well, I do, I do, I do want to have another discussion with you about the Xerox case in which you were involved. Yeah. And, and the reason why is that there are so many of those kinds of mass uh, shootings today, yeah. and you don't have to wait three days to find another one. And um, so I would really like to explore that case and what it teaches us also with you. Uh, and that'll be a lot less pleasant conversation than this because that's pretty grim and gruesome. And yeah. so, and it, it should be discussed. Thank you, Peter. Peter Carlisle. Jay, always a pleasure, my always friend. Always a pleasure. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs>